What's going on, guys? Welcome to another episode of Bro History. It's Henry Zamoda and Danny Abdeljabar. What's going on, man? How are you? Doing well, man. How about yourself? I'm doing pretty well. I appreciate you asking. And um, enough uh, enough playing grab ass. We have to <laughs> we have to jump right into this episode because we have so many topics to cover today, all yep. in one podcast. And uh, I'm not sure how we're going to get all this in here. Neither um, am I. <laughs> so I guess uh, the, the two main things that we want to talk about today is that, or the two main things are uh, coronavirus being, I guess, the first topic we're going to speak about, and then we're going to transition over to what's going on in Syria and Turkey right now. Um, it was kind of hard picking what stories to follow this week just because, you know, like always, you know, there's always things going on in the world that you want to cover. But I feel like the past two weeks have been just um, shotguns of, of uh, news stories coming out. So it's been hard to it's been hard to concentrate on one. I know that I was yeah, kind of we- like hyperventilating in my room yesterday <laughs> yeah you so frantically I like, I texted me i was like i was frantically texting danny i was like what are we going to talk about i don't know what to talk about like there's too many things going on i don't know what topic to choose should we ch- I, I think i sent him about 10 different ideas for an episode in a row. like in a row I was like we can either do corona we can do libya we can do we can do a backstory on yemen there's just a prisoner exchange in between saudi and houthis but then there was a bombing there was a there was a a, a british fighter jet that was shot down i'm mean, not yeah. a british fighter jet Jet, but a, 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 a tornado or whatever. The, That's a fighter uh, jet. Yeah. yeah, the British made one, not mm-hmm. a British pilot was shot down. Mm-hmm. Um, but then there's all these border disputes in, in Syria right now. Um, there's just so many damn things going on. But the top the Democratic debates going on. Uh, seriously, and um, holy shit, I just watched the first 15 minutes of that. And man, I wish we <laughs> released on Friday instead because I got some stuff to talk about. But anyway, I digress. Yeah, there's uh, there's 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 too many things. We need a daily show, just a daily <laughs> show that we can just get. Just all quit this our out jobs there. daily. We're just, just, just do just this. Just quit our day. lives. Just do yeah. this full time. Yep. You can support us on Patreon, Bro History, right? If you um, want us to do that, or or rate and review the podcast. <laughs> yeah, seriously, we're all, we'll ask up front this time. <laughs> yeah, we'll ask up front so we don't forget. Rate and review the podcast. Number one way to support. But uh, yeah, let's stop playing grab ass and let's get to this episode. Um, so coronavirus. I will admit, um, I feel like I do this a lot before our episodes. I have <laughs> to plead my, I plead my ignorance a lot on topics, um, but I don't really know too much about coronavirus. It doesn't really do it for viruses and pandemics and, and dis- contagious diseases don't really do it for me that much. <laughs> I don't know why, but um, a lot of people that I know, this has been kind of like the top story of mind, um, like, oh, we're going to get coronavirus. Yeah, um, I mean, we've both been sick in the last couple of weeks, and like we probably joked at least 10 times that we caught the coronavirus but i was sick before yeah. this was a thing so yeah. cr- there was no coronavirus or at least there wasn't a, maybe uh, maybe a you're patient booster. zero maybe i'm patient zero i'm the guy who banged the ape that got everyone <laughs> coronavirus jesus uh, let's not right. go there <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> all right so why don't we start off this um explain to me assuming that i'm completely ignorant to everything that's going on in the world mm-hmm. what is coronavirus so uh, coronavirus isn't the name. Uh, coronavirus is a thing, right? And it's one word, by the way. It's not like, you know, you got sick off drinking too many Coronas during Cinco de Mayo. It's it's a type of infectious disease. Uh, so um, the one that we're talking about today is called the novel coronavirus. Wait, real quick. Is the yeah. fridge off? Is the fridge off? In your yeah. background? Okay. Yeah. All right. Sorry. I'm sorry. Jesus Christ, Henry. You couldn't ask me this before? Let's leave that in. It might be funny. Uh, uh, okay. So, according to the CDC, uh, a novel coronavirus is a new coronavirus, right? So, novel meaning new, uh, that has not been previously identified. Um, the virus uh, causing coronavirus disease 2019, or COVID-19, is... Uh, not the same uh, as uh, the coronaviruses that commonly circulate among human beings uh, that cause mild illnesses like the cold, right? So it's not the same. The coronavirus is like a like a type of virus, right? Um, so on uh, the 11th of February, so just very recently, the International Committee on the Taxonomy of Viruses. Jeez, I feel, I feel like such a fucking nerd because the things that I had to read to get prepared for this is, is weird. Um, anyway, uh, so they, they, they are um, basically responsible for naming well, I'll just viruses. respond and say we mm-hmm. read way weirder stuff to get prepared for this show than, yeah. than medical blogs. <laughs> It's just like weird because like I'm not a doctor and like you, you, I, 
this doesn't like this isn't a thing for me either but i try to treat it like i like i do every other podcast and just get find the interesting parts uh anyway so there's, there's this international committee on the taxonomy of viruses that you'll never hear about ever again um but they uh, were charged with actually naming this like we've all just been calling it the novel coronavirus 19 um but it didn't actually have a name until just very recently uh so they're calling it severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus 2 shortened to SARS-CoV-2. Uh, you might recognize that word. Uh, so as the name indicates, uh, the virus is related to the SARS-associated coronavirus or SARS-CoV um, that caused uh, an outbreak of you know respiratory syndromes in 2002 and 2003. But it's not the same. So they're calling it SARS 2.0. Uh, but I, I think they already like missed the boat on this. They took too long. Everyone's just calling it coronavirus, you know? So... You know, whatever. That's a coronavirus. It's a type of virus. Uh, so, that, uh, go ahead. so when did this break outbreak start? Uh, well, so uh, it's a little murky specifically when it started out, but I think most of the starting point is December 2019. Um, so they're considering this the 2019-2020 coronavirus outbreak, uh, which is why they name it COVID-19. Um, and, you know, it was caused by that SARS-CoV-2 that I just um, uh, spoke about. So it started in December uh, and for the where it was first uh, identified in um, in Wuhan, uh, which is a major city uh, in China. It's the capital of the Hubei province. Uh, and 41 people just like rapidly developed pneumonia or signs of pneumonia with like no one knew how the hell they got this. Um, and pretty much uh, it's been mostly focused on in china partly because they locked the whole city of uh wuhan and surrounding areas down um but also partly because of uh, uh the way that the disease is transmitted which I'll, I'll i'll get to that in a second but um it's not just uh um china so you know countries like thailand japan macau south korea taiwan uh the u.s um and and a bunch of other places as well um there are dozens of other countries which uh has spread uh which this virus has spread to do you know where in the u.s it spread to uh well they're all quarantined in california <laughs> okay um so uh it, it's that's how they say but we did have we finally um, have our pretext uh, to quarantine <laughs> the entire state of california <laughs> no they're they're in an, like most of the people that had it or have it um uh, have been or came from Wuhan to uh, the United States got got dropped off in an Air Force base in in um, in California. Uh, but there was uh, reported cases in New York, um, two of them actually, uh, and there's I think three more. Um, I'm losing my mind here. There are so many reported cases uh, and so much data flowing through, and this is actually part of the problem. Um, and, and we'll talk a little bit later about, you know, the, uh, you know, the, we obviously have a, uh, a pandemic and of, of a virus here, but we also have what's called like an infodemic, um, which is, uh, basically a, a viral spread of misinformation, <laughs> uh, which is, you know, uh, not uncommon, uh, in general. Uh, and especially when we do our news shows, I mean, like we're about to talk about Syria in a little bit. And, you know, as we've pointed out in our previous episode, like we have to rely on the information that comes out of the ground in countries where, you know, it's not exactly, you know, greatly known for their free press. Right. Um, but so I'm struggling um, giving you like the most accurate data because a lot of it is coming from China and China does a lot of censorship. So it's kind of hard to tell. I know it's it's like um, I think a good example of that is if any if anyone see the movie um, Chernobyl, which I thought was very good, how the you mean the series on, on HBO. Yeah, the series mm -hmm. on HBO, right. how basically the Soviet Communist Party, they were giving out propaganda numbers on on everything um from everything to their progress um with um I'm forgetting containing the it mm -hmm. contain containing the radiation right. spread to i think the number of people who've gotten radiation sickness um and, and china is like that uh you know china is a government that is that has a social credit has a social credit score. Um, okay, we 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 could get into the political that banned implications. Winnie, that but. banned Winnie the Pooh. 
Um, yeah, so. and, and Peppa the Pig, but um, <laughs> Peppa the Pig too. Yeah, yeah, them shit. R.I.P. Anyway, who, we, we, I definitely want to talk who about like, like the, Peppa the Pig in the Chinese government. Uh, I don't know, I don't know, but they they banned Peppa the Pig. So they, they banned Winnie the Pooh because it looks like Jing, uh, Xi Jinping. Xi Jinping. Yeah, um, which is a pretty good comparison. But um, <laughs> yeah, yeah really I didn't is. mean to cut you off. No, it's fine. And we can definitely get into like the political stuff because there's a lot of it. Um, but I, I kind of want to just keep keep our, our listeners informed and, and, and tell them a little bit more about like the disease itself and, and some of the statistics there. So um, one of the things that uh, is really hard to pin down um, and there's not a lot of good uh, supporting data around this, but uh it's how how this started right and so that it's always the question uh there it sounds like there's an outbreak in the background yeah let me just let wait until it goes away they're, they're watching the debate so there's probably some crazy shit going on <laughs> in my household we get loud for political debates instead of uh <laughs> sporting events which is weird okay i think it's passed wait all right, we're good. Um, okay, so according uh, to the CDC, um, the Center for Disease Control here in the United States, uh, they've done an analysis on the genetic tree of the virus, uh, and it indicates that it probably originated in bats, uh, like the, the animal, a bat. Um, but whether that virus uh, came directly from bats or whether there was like a, uh, like a middle middleman animal that uh, it passed through is not known. So we can't really figure out what started it to try and prevent it. Uh, but I think most people are going with bats. It's bats. Um, so the old SARS back in 2002 was also uh, bat originated, um, but uh, it it actually uh, jumped to people via civets, so the little mites uh, on the bats. Um, but also uh, MERS, so the um, Middle Eastern uh, uh, Respiratory Syndrome, uh, which happened in 2011 and 12, that one was actually started uh, from camels. Um, so a lot of these coronaviruses, they actually originally in like another animal, right? And they somehow like pass through. Um, but this one in particular has been really hard to track down uh, the exact source. Um, but scientists are, are at this point saying pretty confidently it had to have started with a bat. How it got to people, we don't know. You know, maybe it transmitted to another type of animal and then to us. Maybe somebody had sex with a bat. We don't know. <laughs> um but the rumor spreading around that I found super interesting, so a clear indication, this is a rumor, this is not like evidence or anything like that, but uh, evidently, uh, okay, so I guess I want you guys to, to Google this because it's wild. Chinese people in this Wuhan uh, 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 city, evidently they eat bats, but they don't eat bats like, you know, like they cut it up and like, you know, put it in the food. They put a whole goddamn bat in like a soup bowl. And they like, and face and all, wings, everything. Like, just, they eat, it's the craziest shit I've ever seen. Google that shit, Henry. It's, it is not it's normal ridiculous. To eat, it's not normal to eat bats. Um, no, but it's like rats. a... But, but uh, I just want to add like a something. thing that they do. <laughs> no, but I want to add context to why they do it there. Um, mm -hmm. The reason why people in China eat crazy stuff like, you know, cats and rats and bats and, you know, all animals that rhyme with at. Um, is because of the terrible systems that took place, the, ter ter the terrible government systems and political systems that took place in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. That's right. All these people were starving. Mm -hmm. So they started eating rats and bats. They just started just eating random, anything. Yep. They started eating anything. That's why they have these eating habits of eating things right. that are weird. And like so eating it's not bats. just because they're, they're, they're <laughs> weird. It's because of they were starving right and that became a part of their culture but but the thing is that yeah eating a bat in and of itself isn't i guess so crazy i mean it's it's definitely different and odd for us as americans but the fact that they literally just char grill a bat the whole thing and stick it in there i was just like blown away i'm like damn i've seen that before though in, in that, documentaries about african tribes and and uh you know they they catch uh you know fruit bats and they eat them you know people eat spiders in some places like yeah but i don't want to i don't want to see what the animal looks like when i eat it <laughs> i know <laughs> like it is I, <laughs> quite graphic when you see like, the outline I just don't, of the animal like if a, like for example shrimp shrimp is not like uncommon right to eat right but if if you look at a shrimp 
in its form before you eat it, like it's creepy and gross, you know? Uh, and if, if a shrimp is not prepared like super well where I can't tell what it looked like before it died, it's like, it grosses me out a little bit. I don't you're, know. You're not Maybe a fan I'm a of, pussy. <laughs> you're not a fan of the tentacles? No. no I hate I'm that. Not, yeah, I don't like it. it. You, but Cut the those damn legs though, off. The shame is though, a lot of really good seafood places, the shrimp comes with the tentacles. Like I, yeah, some of the I, best shrimp I've had it has the tentacles. Yeah, I, I just can't. Um, but just I'm just can't. like at the same time, I'm like I really wish they they removed these tentacles prior to. to <laughs> yeah, like I don't want to see it. You know, yeah, I don't want to see it's like no. its legs and I don't want uh, like its face looking at me and shit. This is super weird. My, I don't know. My girlfriend's in Florida right now, mm-hmm. and she's eating octopus and mm-hmm. i'm like totally against eating octopi octopi i think they're too smart to eat right I think they're they, almost sentient yeah they're almost sentient so i'm anti-eating octopus even though it's still kind of an arbitrary line right you know with the animals that we choose to eat and not <laughs> yeah. eat yeah. um but i've seen o- octopi prepared before like still living like on meals mm-hmm. and you know the the person who eats it you know they stick the fork in it and they kill it and they eat it almost entirely raw. right and it's like wriggling still yeah it's mm-hmm. disgusting yeah yeah I, I, I am totally grossed out like from yeah. that it's like indiana jones and in temple of doom you ever see that y- yeah mm-hmm. <laughs> when they're too eating, much like monkey brain and yep. stuff can't do it mm-hmm no, nope. right. yeah, hard no. All right, so we, we we went off the rails a little bit, but the point about this bats thing is that a lot of uh, the rumor that's going around is that they were eating bats, right? Uh, and that's how they got it. So evidently, this uh, um, the epicenter of this was the the Wuhan like fish market, right? Um, but uh, uh, in this fish market, they often sell other animals for consumption for for eating purposes, like you know bats among them, but also things like hedgehogs and and like random other things. Uh, uh, that they eat as well. Now, they're not supposed to, but they do it anyway, right? And uh, the rumor that's going around is that uh, infected bats were purchased and then subsequently eat it, eaten, and then that's how it spread. So totally a rumor, um, but seeing how the scientists kind of found that link to bats, I guess, you know, the, that theory has legs, uh, kind of, or wings, I should say. Um, but uh, so... That that's like kind of the how, and the how is super murky. But uh, we do know uh, a little bit about the symptoms uh, and how it spreads. Kind of, not really. Uh, so it, it can spread between people uh, within that time of first exposure uh, when you first start seeing those uh, symptoms between two and fourteen days. So it's like about a two week thing. It's its symptoms include fever, cough, shortness of breath. Um, but like the more uh, serious complications can include like things like pneumonia or acute respiratory, uh, uh, distress syndrome. Um, so it sounds like the fucking flu, right? There's no, (laughs) like just looking at it itself. It, it's really hard to tell what it is unless you actually get tested. Um, and the fucked up part is that there's no vaccine, uh, or specific like antiviral treatment. Like there's no Z pack for the, you know, for the coronavirus here. Um, and you know, those things typically help the management of those um uh, of those symptoms and that's that's pretty much you know all that they have right they're just basically taking over the counter stuff um to manage it but it's it's not really doing a good enough job um interestingly enough i didn't actually take notes on this but i remember reading um philip morris uh actually uh is is doing some work to infect tobacco plants um, with the coronavirus, uh, to create a plant-based vaccine, uh, or, uh, treatment. Um, and I found that really crazy, but evidently they were doing this for SARS as well. Um, but yeah, you, 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 you never know. So they're, they're trying to make plant-based, um, you know, vaccines. Cause typically when they make a vaccine, they inject the, you know, the, the, the virus into like an egg or something like that. Right. Which is why like vegans and things like that don't like taking a lot of vaccines cause they're not, they're not vegan. Um, cause most of them are made with eggs. Really? <laughs> that's, that's why they don't take vaccines. Well, uh, I many mean, of them, many of them don't. I mean, yeah. I, well, first of all, I didn't know that vegans didn't were anti-vaxxers. Uh, I don't, I wouldn't necessarily say that they're anti-vaxxers. I say that, you know, a lot of them are acutely, um, you know, uh, because there are some plant-based versions of them and Philip Morris, the, the tobacco company is trying to develop one themselves. Um, there are some plant-based alternative ones, but like the majority of these vaccines are actually made with animal products, um, which kind of runs counter to being a vegan. So there's some, there's some issues there. 
So, so how does this, um, so statistically wise, like how does this, how does this stack up right now to other, to other viruses that we've seen? Cool. Um, well, uh, just first on the coronavirus, as of like yesterday, uh, there's been 75,000 cases confirmed uh, of, um, of coronavirus, uh, including in every single province of China and more than two dozen countries. Um, so of these uh, 11,000, almost 8,000, uh, 12,000 cases uh, have been very serious. Um, and in China, the daily rate of new clinically confirmed cases, that peaked uh, between uh, January 23rd and 27th. But the cases of um, like uh, diagnosed via the throat swab method um, peaked on the 4th of February. So, you know, these these numbers in terms of confirmed cases keep going up and up. Um, the possible number of people that uh, could be infected it might actually be much larger than the confirmed cases. Uh, and part of this is because of how the disease spreads, uh, which is unclear. Um, but also part of it is because the way that medical professions count uh, professionals count the coronavirus sufferers has been loosened a bit uh, to include pretty much almost anyone with symptoms. So it's really hard to get everybody swabbed. And because of the lockdown that's happening, in the Wuhan and surrounding areas, uh, it's hard to even just get the supplies in there to, you know, to just diagnose it, let alone treat it. Um, so it's kind of a clusterfuck. So you ask the question, you know, how does it stack up? And this is definitely, you know, a question that I wanted to ta tackle because uh, about a week or two ago, uh, a good friend of mine who I'm not going to name uh, because she listens to the show and I don't want to dox her, but we had a lively uh, debate about it uh, and she was very much... Um, uh, not anti uh, um, uh, coronavirus, but more she was just pointing out the fact that the regular flu kills way more people and we're not like as freaked out about it. Um, and, you know, while I definitely took her word for it, I also was kind of on the side of like, hey, this is pretty bad, or at least it seems pretty bad uh, from the news that I'm reading. So I did the research um, and I went in and I wanted to look at, you know, how does it stack up? So it's literally today, uh, um, CNN came out with a pretty good uh, um, article, and it uh, confirmed 44,672 cases uh, that the Ch this is coming from the Chinese CDC. Um, and they also said that there were 1,023 deaths, uh, which gives us a crude mortality rate of 2.3%, um, which is pretty much in line with uh, like other external studies and projections. So I, I, I don't um, think that there's any... Um, any manipulation of the data there like it seems pretty consistent with other um other studies that have been done um so quickly on the crude mortality rate it's literally just taking confirmed cases or rather deaths over the confirmed cases it's a simple calculation right um now looking back at some other similar ones like for example sars 1.0 uh that happened back in 2003 uh that had a mortality rate of 9.6 percent um, so higher, much higher. Um, but also that's was back in 2003 and we've had an opportunity to go back and like actually count it all. Um, and MERS was even worse. Uh, the Middle East, uh, um, uh, uh, respiratory syndrome, which happened, uh, in Saudi Arabia in 2012, uh, that actually had a case fatality rate of 35%, right? So even higher. Um, and like, how does this stack up against the regular flu? Because this is what my friend, you know, is really arguing for. So the flu kills m tens of millions of people. So, it, you know, just in the United States alone, um, this season, it's killed tens of millions of people. But it also has a mortality rate of about 0.1%, according to the most recent estimates from the US CDC, right? So, you know... Maybe I'll just read a quote, right? So I was poking around in, in random like web uh, forums and, and like uh, I, I came across mdmagazine.com uh, and there was a doctor uh, that wrote an article about this. It was really well informed, uh, but he had some opinions um, and uh, I'll just read one for you. Uh, so this is Dr. Simon Murray. Uh, he says, uh, the fact remains that this strain of coronavirus is not highly contagious. It behaves very similarly to uh, other infectious viruses uh, by targeting mainly the weak or the immunocompromised portions of the population. For most of us, contracting the coronavirus infection will lead to a flu-like syndrome, and the majority of patients will most likely survive, very similar to the majority of people who get the flu. Um, so he's a doctor. He knows a lot more than I do. Um, but just measuring the data from this uh, is 
you know, I, I get a perspective that, you know, there's still a whole lot unknown about the virus. As an example that we just pointed out, it we don't know exactly how it started, how it spreads from person to person isn't super clear. Um, and while that seasonal flu is definitely more deadly in terms of the volume, like the gr- the number of deaths, if you did statistically look at it, um, as as is pointed out by this the CDC, you know it is statistically you're statistically less likely to die from you know uh, the flu um, in terms of like if you catch it, 001 percent chance that you'll die as opposed to a 2.3 percent chance if you get coronavirus, right? So that means um, that. While it's while the flu is killing more people, it just means that a greater number of people are surviving the flu than are, you know, surviving the coronavirus when they get infected. It's about like scale for me and why I think people are freaking out about it. Well, I think there's a a million different reasons why people are freaking out about it. Um, A lot of them are political. Um, But I definitely think that we have to pay attention to these epidemics because this thing sprung out of nowhere got very, very violent very quickly um, and spread to lots and lots of different countries. Like, you know, the seasonal flu is not just one strain. It's like several different strains all over the you know world. But this one is one that is very, very deadly specifically to these people and is more deadly uh, like percentage wise, meaning number of people who actually survive it. Um, is lower than the number of people who survived the flu. So we don't get up in arms about the flu because literally everybody gets it, right? Um, and like the overwhelming majority of people survive it. So that's why I think it's it's important to think about it that way. So so let me just break this down in non-nerd talk. So you're more likely to get the flu, but it's less likely to kill you because coronavirus, it more often than not targets discriminately. It targets the old and the young who are less likely to survive the virus. Correct. Didn't. That's that's correct, right? Those people are more susceptible to that to those viruses, so it's going to kill more of those people, whereas the flu just kind of affects everybody, which makes the mortality rate among the flu uh, sufferers lower. Now, it'd be interesting in like 10 years when they're able to compile all the data and we're past this to see what's the mortality rate uh, of the coronavirus again for the same segment of people like you know old people you know is coronavirus more deadly towards old people than the regular flu right but only time can tell that and i think that's time that we don't necessarily have it's certainly time that you know the people in china and wuhan they don't have this time for us to sit down and think hey hey is this really a problem like so china decided to lock down wuhan and this is part of the political controversies that i'd like to get to um did you, did you have you read anything about this? I know that you're not like super um, in on the coronavirus in general, but like, have you been reading about this? Yeah, I've been reading about um, what's going on in Japan with the cruise ship, as mm-hmm. well as the quarantine of Wuhan, and I've been sure. watching some of the videos. There was a video of a lady who was quarantined, and she was denouncing the Chinese government. Right. Um, I don't know if you saw that before, but oh, it was yeah. pretty. It was pretty sad. Um, so I've seen a lot of the major headlines. Um, you know, my main thoughts are, are you know, <laughs> kind of funny. It, one of my thought first thoughts was, what's Japan going to do with the Olympics? Or are they do they feel like this will um, cause tourists not to want to come to Japan because it's of possible. the and which is very possible. And yes. then China's implication of China going full measure to to um, to literally bolt people into their houses or into their apartments yeah um it's going to cause a stir especially when you know more and more information is about <clears throat> more and more information is getting out about them you know <clears throat> excuse me about them having concentration camps and and you know western china with uyghur camps and re-education camps which are being even further uh, uh, further investigated where they're much larger than people thought so i mean those implications always pop up in my head with china but as far as like the actual disease itself like i haven't been doing my homework as far as Mm -hmm. like what is this virus how deadly is it is it you know is is it more hype than than fear like is there an actual um are these symptoms um you know, what are the exact symptoms? What are the chances of you and I getting it? And you know, what is it, what are the chances of it spreading across the Pacific Ocean to the United States? Um, you know, I don't I don't know that. But I actually kind of agreed with your friend who you said you had a debate with earlier, right. where mm-hmm. I 
think that a lot of media outlets are, are overplaying this just because it's a juicy topic. Like, ooh, For scary sure. diseases. Like, you know, I, I a lot of my friends and people I know who um, have been following the story uh, pretty closely. And, you know, you and I both live in New York. I'm, I'm mm-hmm. sure you've seen people wearing their masks. I mean, I see people wearing those masks all the time. We have a huge Asian population. But there's more. Like, population. But there's, there, there are more people wearing these masks i don't know i think i think it's like the the you know the new car thing right like if you buy a new car then suddenly you start seeing that car everywhere right it's not because there are more of those cars it's because you're now taking notice to this car because you have it i think uh you know with all the media surrounding this now people are taking notice to people who are wearing these surgical masks and they've been doing this especially in new york forever like they always they've been doing they've always been doing this but i see way more i don't know man I I I disagree with that. I think I th- I think there's a little bit of you know like this. You never took notice of it because it was just a normal New York thing, and now you're seeing it, and you're like, oh, there's a lot more of these going on because you weren't taking notice to it before. And this is part of the, like the 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 controversies that's surrounding this, and I definitely want to talk about that in a second. So let's put put a pin in that because I first want to talk about just the quarantine of Wuhan because I think our our listeners probably want to know what's going on over there because this is the reason why it's so juicy this topic, right? Because Wuhan is a city of eleven million people, right? I, I talked about this in a previous episode. This is like a what China would consider a second class city, and not because like they're you know shitting on them. It's it's more like a. a, a technical designation like think of um if if beijing or shanghai is a tier one city that's like new york city right whereas wuhan is a tier two city or a second class city which is like i don't know st louis or something like that right um so it's a smaller city but still a major massive city right um and they basically shut it down they completely isolated it there have been cases of like people being barred into their apartments um so the and they've been amping up these measures, too, and that's why we're hearing so much about it. Um, you know, they're amping it up. Uh, basically, people, China barred people from leaving Wuhan or entering Wuhan uh, and then expanded that restriction um, to the central province of Hubei uh, and, and now confines up to 50 million people. So we got 50 million people on lockdown now, um, including all of Wuhan. Uh, and this has made it super difficult uh, you know, because the tr- they've blocked down the transportation, so it's hard for them to restock dwindling medical supplies, um, and it also raised, you know, food shortages. Uh, uh, you know, this is already occurring now uh, and can get worse if they don't figure this shit out. Um, but, you know, the, the, the confirmed number of infections in this area has been doubling every four days. Um, so... It's clear that the Chinese government, they do not have a handle on this. And that's why this is such a big story in the news right now, because they're losing it. Like they're literally China's literally losing it right now. Um, And I think that's probably the bigger story than the actual disease itself. Like you can fall on either side of the argument for, oh, this isn't a very deadly disease. But you can certainly not deny that China's handling of this um, of this disease has been less than less than great so what's the deal with this japanese cruise ship quarantine the yep. diamond princess that was the diamond princess um it had like 3700 passengers on it um 621 of them uh were infected um and uh basically the, the number of people that were infected uh, on this one cruise ship alone accounts for more than half of all of the recorded cases of coronavirus outside of china so they, this cruise ship has more than half of the uh, um, uh, cases there um, so there were more than 300 Americans on that ship which is why it's news for us um, and 14 of them at least uh, were infected um, and they've been they've been starting to take them off the boat uh, and they've been on this boat for like two weeks already you know um, and you know again it's a story right now because you know there's a lot of criticisms of the you know uh, US government and like how they're acting uh, about this and you know uh, from basically rescuing these people like picking them up off the ship and bringing them back home um, you know part of it is that you know we don't want to start a coronavirus epidemic here in the United States but also part of it is you know kind of just slow bureaucratic feet dragging i mean it was 
crazy some of the stories that I was hearing about um, how they were trying to get people out of uh, Wuhan, uh, mainland China, and they haphazardly threw together like a flight to get everybody out, um, but people had to pay to leave. And they weren't like, let's say I, I'm an American living in China uh, and I happen to marry, you know, a Chinese woman. Um, she's not allowed to come with me, you know. Um, and so I had to choose, like, stay here with my family or go to the United States and be safe, you know. So there's there's been a lot of, like, shit showery uh, going on around this. But specifically around this Diamond Princess, they've been on this on a boat, literally in a boat, like, for two weeks. And now they're coming back. Uh, and they're going to be quarantined again, uh, this time at Travis Air Force Base in California. Um, so, you know, sucks to be them. Uh, they're basically like a month of their life is gone, at least. That sucks. <laughs> yeah, it really <laughs> that, does. That really does suck. Yeah. But, you know, another reason to, uh, if, they're, if they're quarantined in California, let's just put up a, a wall between uh, on the San Andreas fault line <laughs> and, and quarantine the entire state. <laughs> what do you say? What yep. do you say? Yeah. We go eat some hay right by the bay. <laughs> um, so another thing that I was confused about was I heard some doctor, some doctor, Dr. D. Wen Ling. Um, Lee Wen Liang. Dr. Lee, Dr. Lee Wen Lang. Let's just call him Dr. Lee. Dr. Lee. Um, mm -hmm. So this guy apparently... He died, right? Right, he died. He died. Mm -hmm. he died of the virus, or he died of the coronavirus. Correct. He died of the coronavirus, mm -hmm. and well, what's what exactly is going on with this guy? All right, so Doctor Lee his, with, his, with um, his death, like what were the troubling aspects of his death? Yep. So Doctor Lee, uh, so some background on him: he's thirty-four. Um, you know, tragically, he was expecting a second child. Uh, he left behind that first child and his wife. Um, he was an ophthalmologist in Wuhan. Um, was just like kind of a nobody, uh, just like a regular doctor, you know. Um, but in early January, um, you know, he had been uh, uh, whistleblowing basically about how the Chinese government had been handling this virus, and he was helping. You know, um, he's he's a fucking ophthalmologist, and he was helping you know treat these patients, right? Um, because of the sh the absolute shortage of medical staff, uh, and then in early January, he was basically called in. Um, by both medical officials and the police, and he was forced to sign a statement denouncing his warnings as an, quote, unfounded and illegal rumor, unquote. Um, so basically, China, the Chinese government, they crack down on this guy um, because they don't want people to know that this is a shit show. I mean, you, you talked about um, you talked about Chernobyl, right? Like this is pretty similar in, in my opinion you know basically the coronavirus is the is the chernobyl uh, um uh, uh plant melting down right and the fallout of this you know they're trying to con like they can't deny that it melted down it is a thing right people from all over the world know it right but they can try and diminish the uh you know the political impact right they oh no we, we we have it under control it's it's going fine um but also there is just like a domestic thing there right they want the chinese government also you know like we talk shit about the chinese government all the time but like they have a vested interest in making sure people don't freak out about this in china either you know like they don't want people to just overreact to it because again like i pointed out earlier we don't know a whole lot about this. We don't know how it's transmitted. We don't know how dangerous it could be. All we know is that there's a lot of people that have it and that the numbers are growing every day, right? So they're trying to mitigate like a lot of these issues, but in so doing, they basically, they brought down the, the censorship hammer on this guy. And this has caused like a big conversation in China about freedom of speech. Um, and his death um, exposed kind of a big issue with this epidemic that people don't often talk about and it's just the number of doctors and nurses and medical workers that are infected by the by the disease itself right so you know part of this quarantine is actually like just killing the people that are trying to solve it so it's it's a fucking mess man yeah man it's um <clears throat> it's 
Do you think that this is going to raise Chinese xenophobia? Absolutely. Abs- absolutely. And, and it's already happening. You know, uh, I'm not calling you xenophobic, but I am saying that your heightened awareness of people wearing face masks is 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 a tiny little portion of what we're already seeing, you know, with all of this news and all this fervor and fear around the coronavirus. I was reading some reports of people that are just literally afraid to talk to Asian people, not just Chinese people, Asian people. And it's it's sad. Um, so this guy, Dr. Murray, uh, who I quoted earlier, he he also had quite a few things to say about this. You know, you know, he says that basically he points out that the fact that airlines have been refusing to travel to China uh, because of this um, and uh, China refuses to. Uh, Chinese passengers and tourists from entering certain countries. Uh, so this is like a quid pro quo, a tit for tat going on there. Um, a bunch of Western businesses have closed in China. Um, a bunch of expats from uh, uh, living in China have returned to their host home countries. Um, he's he also points out that you know obviously the Chinese government hasn't been super honest or upfront about how it has dealt with it. Um, but you know it's it's a he points out that it's a little absurd and it's kind of xenophobic um he also quotes i will read this uh because this is to my friend's credit the fact is uh, a chinese visitor uh, visiting the united states at this time is ten thousand times more likely to die from influenza than an american visiting china is from dying of the coronavirus in any case, wearing masks affords little protection against the coronavirus since the virus is small enough to penetrate the microfibers of the most masks. Uh, and the strain of coronavirus appears to be far less contagious than the flu. The fact is, an illness, uh, influenza is an illness that's far more deadly, but also more familiar to us. The current coronavirus outbreak, which originated in China, serves as a surrogate for a good deal of xenophobia and fear to the country itself. Um, and while I agree with most of what he says, you know, I, I think the the underlying point uh, that he tries to make in this last passage of his article is that we're overreacting about something that we don't know enough about, and our anti-Chinese fervor in general is really drumming up the pot here. Well, dude, this sounds familiar to SARS, man. It absolutely is. I, I the same thing went on is. when SARS was a thing, and also the people who I'm seeing, like the reason why there's a heightened awareness on my side, because I'm not seeing Asian people wear the mask. I'm seeing, you know, white chicks wear them. So it's not. That's what I'm seeing right now. There's there's a, in New York City, you always see Asian people wearing medical surgical masks. Right. Um, not every Asian person, but like Many one of out of one out of fifty. Let's just say. Um, will wear a surgical mask. I might even be too liberal with that number. Um, now you're seeing a lot more people wear them. You're saying you don't, you haven't noticed that. Yeah, I'm, I'm saying I haven't noticed that. Um, but also, uh, you know, I've, I've not seen any any non Asian people wearing them either. So if that's what you're seeing, then then I can see how that would spark your interest there. But again, it's also kind of silly because as the doctor says. Like the virus is small enough to go through those masks, you like that's not going to stop you. It certainly didn't prevent, you know, Doctor Lee from dying. I'm sure he was wearing a surgical mask when he was treating people. You know, so like, aren't surgical like, masks just there to protect the surgeons from like from what a surgical like, mask is supposed to do is is protect both people, right? It's supposed to protect you from inhaling anything right or like blood spatter from going into your mouth and shit like if you're doing surgery but also it's from you from like breathing or sneezing into an open body right um but the thing about the virus is that the virus the 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 structure like the size of each of these virus cells is smaller than the fibers so it can pass through the fiber right and we still don't understand how it's transmitted so if it's an airborne transmission then it stands to reason that the surgical mask isn't going to prevent you from spreading or contracting it because it can go through the the fibers. Well, now's a good time to buy a bro history surgical mask. We have them <laughs> We're on sale at bro history on brohistory.com. Yep. And let's just be clear. This is the only surgical mask that will protect you from coronavirus. I don't think we can legally say that. 
Okay. Um, I recant that. It's one of many, but this is this will this will do the best job. <laughs> this will do as good a job as any other surgical mask. And this will be just as good as another surgical mask. But it's cooler because it says bro history on it. Yeah. Um it will be out in um ten years. Okay. <laughs> so what else do we need to know about this uh about this virus? Uh, Look, before I don't, we jump I don't, into Yeah, I, I don't think that it's gonna spread to the United States. Um you know partly because of how we've been, you know, quarantining people who kind of came from the area and, and making them wait like up to two weeks uh, to make sure that they're not um, still ill. And from what we know, uh, the coronavirus, you know, you're, you're, uh, the window of infecting other people when you have it is two and between two and 14 days, right? So people are, are, are sitting around in quarantine coming from those countries from for two weeks so i it's pretty safe to say that when they return home they're not going to spread it to other people um and since it, it is across the ocean you know you're not going to get it from like chinese packages like a lot of people have been like freaking out about their their deli- their deliveries that they're getting from ebay and shit it, you can't get it that way or at least there's no evidence that you can get it that way um so don't stop shopping don't stop your regular life you know the fact of the matter is that the flu will probably kill you sooner. Um, however, if you do get coronavirus, you have a higher likelihood of dying. <laughs> so just uh, just understand that. So everyone, just um, if you have anything that's made from China, immediately throw it out. Yeah, maybe this is all like uh, an American manufacturing, like, you know, uh, the globalists are uh, setting up some propaganda videos to make you throw away your Chinese goods, you know? <laughs> Um, I mean, I think Alex Jones would probably support that. <laughs> Maybe. Um, all right, let's transition over to um, another part in the world because yeah. uh, I guess we've been covering this on this podcast for a long time now. So uh, I want to continue delivering updates on on what's going on follow in Syria. Up from last week, yep. I guess a, a, a quick follow up from a follow up from last week on on Syria and um, you know what's taking place in in the northeast of Syria between, um, you know, Syria and Turkey, who are pretty much uh, actively, or they were actively killing each other's soldiers. So um, there was a big, there was a big update over the weekend. So um, Syria had consolidated control over Aleppo, all of Aleppo, like, you know, Syria liberated Aleppo about two years ago, but there were still suburbs in the area that were still, um, you know, under rebel or, jihadist or terrorist control you know choose your choose your uh, definition for them and they also took uh, complete control of the m5 highway the m5 highway is a highway system that runs from aleppo down to damascus so basically think of it as a like aleppo is like their financial capital so think of it as new york city connecting with washington dc it's like their i-95 that goes down the east coast it connects their two most important cities together their financial hub as well as their their capital so they took they took control of this this major highway. I don't think they have control yet of the M4 highway as we uh, um, as we discussed this, which which collect, uh, which connects Aleppo with the eastern part of the country. Uh, excuse me, the western part of the country. However, it was a big win for them getting the M5 highway. Now, what's interesting about this is that as the Syrian army SAA advances, they're getting closer to a place called Afrin, which is on the Turkish border. The Syria hasn't Syrian army hasn't had a presence up in that area in nine years, and this all happened last weekend. Now, what makes this important is that this gives them very a lot of leverage, or it gave them a lot of leverage, um, or rather, their Russian partners' leverage with their talks with Turkey that happened on Monday. And basically, what this talk was, they're they're negotiating what's going on in Idlib. So in Idlib right now, and I guess if this is the first time, if you tuned in just because you you know you heard about the coronavirus and you're kind of interested, I'll just give a quick recap of this. Even though people who are frequent listeners are probably tired of hearing this, Idlib is the last remaining section of of Syria that has not been liberated by the SS the SAA. That's not Kurdish. So during the war, every everyone was filtered out into this one section in Syria. And now the Syrian government is trying to, you know, they're, they're trying to liberate this. If you're, if you're, uh, 
I guess, speaking as Syria as a sovereign nation. And then if you're a crazy person, then you would say that they're trying to annex it, <laughs> which I've heard people say that word. Yeah. But, but it certainly um, looks like that. It certainly looks like that. But no, they're trying to reclaim part of their country that they lost in the beginning of the war. Um, that is a jihadist hotbed right now full of um, very extreme rebels with very extreme Salafist ideology. Now, from what we know about these negotiations between Russia and Tur- uh, between Russia and Turkey, because Russia is Syria's partner in this war, um, the talks haven't really been going well. Now, what Russia is demanding is that Russia is demanding that there be a 16 kilometer border strip in Idlib under Turkey under under Turkey's control. Now, Russia. Uh, they're demanding Russian control of crossing between Id- the Idlib Strip and Afrin. They're demanding M4 and M5, the M4 and M5 highway reopened under joint Russian and Turkish supervision. And then they're also demanding that Turkey retreat from all their observation points on the border strip. So right now within within Idlib, Turkey has these observation stri- uh, these observation points that they're kind of sprinkling in soldiers and they're using it as a pretext to really heavily arm these areas with Turkish soldiers. With, human with, meat uh, shields, with Tur- basically. Yeah, human meat shields and, and, Tur- and armored vehicles and all that, which makes it a lot more difficult because if you're Syria, you know, you don't really care if you, you know, you're, you're trying to kill the rebels. You're not trying to kill Turkey because Turkey is in NATO. Also, Turkey is, is, has the, the biggest military in the Middle East. So you don't really want an all-out war with them. However, you're still trying to recapture that land. Now, think of it as if the U.S. was trying to, let's just say if they reclaim New York. You know, they reclaim all the United States. They reclaim New York, but all the areas, maybe, um, you know, the Yonkers areas and areas north of New York were still not um, liberated from the United States. They're, that's what they're kind of trying to do. They're trying to get the last remnants of the country. But Turkey's making it a lot more difficult because they're sprinkling in soldiers. They don't want to kill them, obviously. And now Russia is their partner. They're trying to negotiate a peace because everyone's trying to avoid, or what people are saying is that they want to avoid a, um, a mass humanitarian crisis. I mean, there's a mass humanitarian crisis going on there right now, and there has been for a pretty long time. Now, Russia's demands are all favorable to Syria, which would be pretty obvious. And I think what people thought was that maybe Russia would capitulate a little bit more to Turkey because they're such they're, they have very strong economic ties with each other. They're they, you know they're trading partners. They're they're um, Turkey sees a lot of tourism from Russia. Now, Russia totally took the SS the Syria's back on this, and what. And it's just funny because Turkey's insistence on having the SS the SAA leave Idlib is really just coming to a full tilt end. It seems that Turkey's Syrian ambitions are are really imploding as we speak because Russia is not taking their side on this whatsoever. They're sticking with their with their Syrian partners, and I mean, what you're kind of seeing right now is that Turkey is kind of being ostracized. The reason I say that is because not only has Turkey obviously lost Russia, but they also are starting to lose their former Gulf partners. Now, both Saudi Arabia and the UAE, they're trying to restore relations with Assad right now. So the Arab League, you know, the Arab, the same Arab League that condemned Assad eight years ago, is now trying to welcome him back so he can actually take full control over Syria. And I think it's pretty clear that the princes, so meeting the princes of Saudi Arabia and the UAE, they prefer Assad over Erdogan. I mean, when you think about it, like tensions between Saudi Arabia and Turkey have been pretty high over, have been pretty high over the past year and a half. Um, I mean, I think that came to surface to the average person when we saw the murder of Jamal Khashoggi and Turkey was the one that was condemning it. Obviously, it's a pretty big slap in the face if you're going to murder a rival or a dissident journalist or whatever Jamal Khashoggi was at the time on a, a, a Turkish consulate. But we can kind of see the friction there. 
But now it seems that the Arab countries, even including the Gulf states, are starting to take the side of Syria again. And what's interesting about that, in the Syrian war, the Gulf states, they backed the rebels. Saudi Arabia, they were backing the, the most extreme elements in Syria. Now, you would think, like the way that I read this, is that you would think that Erdogan would want Assad as a partner to deal with the Kurds. It was Assad's government, because like people don't know this, but it was Assad's government that expelled the PKK from Syria. Right, via the Adana Agreement. Yes. And it's at this point you have to wonder if Turkey may see some type of blowback from the radicals that they backed in Idlib. Because the moderates, the moderate, it's um, it's hilarious. The, the rebels that they back in Turkey right now, I mean, excuse me, in Idlib right now, they're using them as like they're just their, their own private army for their own interest and all of that. And Assad and Erdogan, they used to have a pretty good relationship. So Assad was the very first Syrian president to ever go visit Ankara. In the past, before Assad was president, when his father was in charge, they used to support all those Kurdish and Armenian leftist groups in Turkey. And Assad actually put a stop to that. The whole, like, it just, you have to look at the absurdity of this. Like, don't you think the whole thing is stupid at this point? Well, yeah, it's 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 so, like, contradictory. But but to, to clear up the point on, on Assad kind of um, putting a stop to supporting the PKK and the different uh, rebel uh, uh, leftist rebel groups there. Um, he ha he is quoted in saying that the reason why he signed the Adana Agreement, which is the agreement that Turkey and Syria had uh, regarding dealing with the PKK, the Tur uh, the Kurdish uh, um, uh, kind of militant group, he said that he felt like he was pressured into doing so. That you know he had to choose between having a a friendly Turkey or dealing you know. Um, or backing these these groups that you know Syria had been backing for you know many years prior. So it wasn't that you know he you know evolved and you know suddenly realized that the PKK is bad. It's it's more like a political uh, um, a hard political choice that he had to make. But nevertheless, he did make that choice, right? And he did you know, uh, try and normalize relationships with Turkey. And now all this shit is happening and it's, it's pretty nuts. And as you point out, you know, the, the, you know, the, these Gulf states that supported, uh, uh, rebels who were against Assad are now trying to welcome Assad back in and Turkey who was once aligned with Syria on this, uh, against the PKK are now kind of against them. And, you know, it, it seems like friends are enemies and enemies are friends, you know, um, it's everything flipped around. Well, what makes it so ridiculous is that Erdogan in, in the AKP, they've already said that they would tolerate Assad if they if he won democratically. If he won a democratic, fair election, they said that they would support him. And you see that like right now there's a lot of internal politics that are going on in Turkey right now that they're trying to get Turkish votes. A lot of a lot of Erdogan's, you know, own his own ministers dis, are disagreeing with his foreign policy, especially his foreign policy in Libya. What's interesting is that Abdullah Akalan, the founder of the PKK, he's in prison right now. He's been in prison for the past 20 years. He's been allowed to send letters out. And he was been out, he's been allowed to send letters out to his former supporters. And what his letters are saying is that he's saying to make peace with Assad. So it's interesting that he's letting he's letting him communicate with on the outside. But Oculon, he he used to be supported by Damascus. Um, like all of these, all of the border communities on the Syrian Turkish border right now, they all support Bashir al Assad. Like, you know, the Syrian Turkish border, it includes a lot of ethnic groups like the Armenians, the Syriacs, um, the Alawites, groups that have been ethnically cleansed by Turkey for a very long time. And the government in Damascus is controlled by a minority coalition. So, you know, it's the opposite of Iraq where, you know, they have a Shia majority and it's a Shia government. And that's why Iran was able to gain such a, you know, the former traitors of, of the Iran-Iraq war who came back as double agents or really however you want to frame this. But it's a Shia-dominated country with a Shia dominated population with a Shia government. 
Syria is the opposite. What Syria has is a Sunni majority country with a minority ran government. But Assad is an Alawite. Assad, an Alawite is a very small percentage, is a very small minority group within Syria. What they have is a coalition of minority groups that control the government together. So it's a lot different. And that's why these Turkish border groups, these Turkish ethnic groups, who are not Sunni Muslim Arabs, are, you know, they, they prefer the Assad government over Turkey because there's not a history of mass genocide or mass. There's In the case of Armenians, there's not a history of mass genocide. Right. In the case of the Kurds, it's there's not a <laughs> there's not a history of mass genocide either. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, I think the question that people need to ask themselves is like, why does Turkey care so much? You know, I mean, really, no one real no one really knows the Machiavellian reasons you know why countries do what they do but i think most most people i think a lot of analysts and you know what i tend to believe as well is that this is mainly because of energy interest um you know syria isn't an oil exporter as you know and if that doesn't make sense like why what's the energy interest on the border of turkey and syria it's not because of like the actual oil fields or the gas reservations or anything like that syria only has enough gas to really to, you know the power of their own economy they can't and even then they, probably they, not they they import oil they do not export oil so all of their oil fields are you know in the north in the kurdish in the kurdish regions and um you know they're they're getting most of their oil from Iran right now, but to understand like the energy politics, you have to understand the pipeline situations. Um, you know, pipelines are not just for transporting gas and oil; they're they're for political leverage as well. Like each country a pipeline passes through is a middleman in the flow of resources. So, in order for energy to you know to reach the the open market, a pipeline has to reach a port. And, you know, once a pipeline reaches a port, oil can be shipped anywhere in the world. You know, the major battle right now that's going on, like the, you know, the major geopolitical battle, and I'm beginning to hate that word more and more, geopolitical battle. It just means geography, um, even though it's part of the podcast. Um, the major battle right now is over the Caspian Basin, and the Caspian Basin is is, like, is, a, is a pretty big focus on, it's, it's a major focus of energy suppliers right now. And Iran has an expanding oil sector. So they signed a $10 billion deal with Iraq and Syria to build a pipeline from southern Iran to Syria. And that's a huge threat to Turkey. Because the way oil is transported right now is is almost through a monopoly system. Um, It's through the BTC pipeline, which goes from Azerbaijan to, to Georgia over to Turkey. So a pipeline that would run from... Iran to Iraq to Syria, right to the Mediterranean, would actually would be a threat to to you know the pipeline monopoly that you have going straight over the Turkey into the Mediterranean. That's why Turkey immediately went from having a friendly relationship to an antagonistic relationship with Assad in the course of one year. Um, and and I think the main you know strategy for for a lot of these countries was not necessarily to overthrow Bashir al Assad was to create as much conflict as possible, almost like in Afghanistan, where it would be impossible to put that infrastructure in place right, or to, deter, to attract foreign to deter capital. The, yeah, the setting up there. So I think that's like where the oil and the energy interest comes from if you look at if you look at the pipeline. Um, I mean obviously it may it may not be a realistic goal anymore because I don't think that pipeline is being built anytime soon, obviously. But um as far as like removing Assad from government, from the government, like no one really, no one wants that anymore. Like there's really, the United States doesn't want that. Like no one is trying to remove Assad from power anymore besides, you know, a small handful of crazy rebels in, in, in Northeastern Syria. But everyone's pretty much accepted that he's won the war right now. So it's like, why, why is Turkey so, is it's, it's just, to me, it just seems all political right now. Like he's trying to save face, and also he's trying to, you know, one of the big factors in in Turkish foreign policy is controlling the border, so they don't have, um, you know, they don't have these PKK groups or or not PK, you know, they don't have Kurdish groups linking with other Kurdish groups. But you know, Assad was was sympathetic to the Kurds. 
I mean, to the, to the Turks in, in that matter. So it seemed like in one foreign policy goal, he completely contradicted another one of his main uh, foreign policy goals, which is probably even more important to the to the Turkish population rather than, you know, you know energy interest. Um, and as and as we pointed out in the last episode, for those who didn't actually listen, go back because there's a lot of details that I think you need to know. But, you know, generally speaking, like the area that that Syria and Turkey are fighting over right now is nowhere near any of the Kurds. <laughs> it's not even close. It's like on the opposite side of the country. So like, you know, yes, like part of their, you know, uh, uh, geopolitical strategy is to make sure that, you know, Kurds don't link up and like try to rebel against Turkey. Yeah, part of it is there, but like also the area that they're operating in right now, uh, like the, you know, Aleppo uh, area, but also like Libya has nothing to do with that, you know, has like zero to do with that. I know it has zero to do with that. I think the real interesting question with Syria right now is going to be what happens because, you know, Russia is obviously trying to bro is, is brokering this. What happens to Syria after Russia pulls out? And specifically what I mean is, like, what happens with the Syrian and Iranian, like, the Iranian influence in Syria. Like, have you ever thought about that? Yeah, I have, actually. Like, what do you think is going to happen after Russia pulls out? I actually think that they will, I think uh, Assad will claim victory. And in order to legitimize his claim to this victory, I think they're going to set up, like, a sham um, election and he'll be voted in. Uh, and even if it's not super sham, like he's got, he won't be. It won't be a sham election right now. I think he's even if it wasn't. Win. Even if it wasn't like like I'm saying, I think it'll be a sham. But even if it's not a sham and it's totally legitimate, he'll win anyway because he's the guy that united Syria. You know, or at least that's the play that he's going to go for politically, right? Um, and from there, uh, how does Iran play into this? I actually think your your pipeline theory makes a bit of sense to me because if we look at not just the relationship between Iran and Syria, but also the relationship and the the ways that Iran has been, uh, um, you know, acting in Iraq, the neighboring country, I think that totally makes sense. Like they could be piping, uh, like Syria already imports a lot of their oil from Iran, so it, it's possible that now Iran will start um, exporting oil uh, through Iraq into Syria and beyond because, uh, you know, they've already kind of laid the groundwork for that middle country, and that's Iraq, you know? So I, I think it's uh, what what you say has, has like, you know, that, that, that piques my interest. Uh, you know, that, that sounds... Well, you know, I don't necessarily think that... I think that Syrian and, Ir- and Iranian relations aren't going to... Um, I don't... I think they have the possibility of chilling out after Russia pulls out. So I think it really is going to be interesting to see what happens there. But Syria and Iran, you have to understand, they couldn't be more apart ideologically. Like, you know, Syria is kind of a throwback to a different era. They're they're the last remnants of uh, pan-Arabism or, or Nasserism. You know, they're a secular state. Iran, on the other hand, is a theocracy. You know, they're governed by Sharia law. And what really had had drawn these two countries together were their mutual disdains for Saddam Hussein. It's like this relation this relationship goes back a long time. Uh, Syria was Iran's key partner in the Iran Iraq War, and what Syria basically did, what Assad's father did, was that he virtually he split the Arab world into, um, you know, in support against the war against Saddam Hussein. You know, he was the person that conventional wisdom and conventional history says that Syria was was Iran's lone supporter. In reality, the Syrians, Assad, Assad's father, what he did is that he convinced the Algerians and the Libyans to support Iran over Iraq during the early years of the Iran-Iraq war. So that was kind of a myth. Now, maybe in the Middle East, that's true. Like Syria was Iran's like lone supporter in the Middle East. However, in, in like the entire Arab world, there are other countries that actually preferred Iran over Saddam Hussein, which included Syria's long allies like Algeria. It's like Syria or Syria and Algeria are tight, and they convinced uh, Gaddafi as well. And what they were doing is that they were running. The, the way it worked is that. 
the Syrians provided bases and, and flights for I, Algerian and, and Libyan arms to Tehran, and that really helped Iran out because during the beginning of the Iran-Iraq war, Iraq was making significant progress, and Iraq was backed by the United States. So they were, I mean, they were, they were, Iran was fighting the United States. The U.S., Iran was dependent on, on contraband for their old planes that they bought, that they had during the era of the Shah. So that's what really kind of draws those countries together. It's, it's usually in in terms of, of, uh, of crisis is when they, is when they connect. But after the war, it's not like Iran dictated what happened in Damascus. Like Havaz al- Havez al-Sad did not let Iran dictate anything. Like a good example would be that, um, you know, during the 80s, um, they supported – Iran and I in Syria, they actually supported different camps of, um, of uh, Shia groups in Lebanon. Like Iran supported Hezbollah and then Syria supported the Amal movement, which was a rival, which was a rival group. So Syria and Iran really just band together during times of crisis. However, outside of crisis mode, they 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 clash a lot in a lot of their goals. And I really don't think Damascus wants, you know, Lebanon to become a theocracy just like they don't want Syria to become a theocracy. So um I I think at the end of the day I think Syrians right now are are deeply suspicious of the Iranians. And honestly, this just comes from different stories that I've heard. I've heard about Quds forces trying to convert members of the SAA to, to 12 or Shia, which is definitely probably pretty weird when you have a largely secular army. You have religious, you, you, you do, I mean, you have religious fanatics on one side trying to convert your army. So um, I don't know. I think it's going to be pretty interesting um, to see what, what their relationship will be like. Obviously, they're probably going to be pretty dependent on them because they're they're both going to be kind of ostracized by the United States, and the United States is going to demand that they, uh, you know, that that any ally of Iran be by be sanctioned and intensely. However, the Gulf states are are lightening up, are, are um, they're you know they're they're warming up to to uh, Assad's government. You know, Saudi Arabia is the big one. The UAE has their embassy in place. I don't know, um, man. Egypt. Like, like w- you. what you're saying makes sense. And like, but you have to remember how crazy this situation is now. You know, to think that it's going to just suddenly normalize, I think, is is kind of naive. You know, like, I don't think it's going to normalize. I just don't think that. I, what I'm, the point I'm trying to make is that the same thing that happened to Iraq after the U.S. invasion and after they after the U.S. removed Saddam Hussein and Iran gained so much influence because of the government that we put in place there that's not going to happen in syria like i don't think you're going to see the same type of influence that iran has over iraq in in syria i'd agree with that like that that's the point i'm trying to make like iran will have way more influence in iraq than in syria um on the upcoming years during the war mainly because i mean iraq and iran first of all they share a border so, I mean, that's the main reason. But second of all, th- their idea, idea, um, religiously and in, in, in when you, in terms of uh, the sectarian divide, they're the same. No, and and I hear that, and I definitely don't think that Iran is going to have that same kind of influence uh, in in Syria as they do in Iraq. But I definitely think that they're going to have an influence, maybe not dictate, you know, like, as you pointed out, I, uh, um, Assad's dad didn't let Iran do shit after, you know, uh, after that war, the Iran-Iraq war. However, you know, you got to think about this, like, Syria has been going through a civil war for a decade, right? They're in serious need of all the support they can get, you know, and they have to make some choices, right? So, like, their neighbor Turkey's fucking with them, right? We have... Iran, um, who was in Syria fighting as well, uh, fighting against uh, 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 terrorists, right? But also, who knows what the fuck they were doing? Because, uh, you know, the Quds forces do, a, a, you know, arm a bunch of different groups. And also, the Gulf states were arming the rebels against them, but now the Gulf states want to open their arms up to them. So, like, and, and again, the U.S., right? We supported moderate rebels, 
right? Uh, and moderate with air quotes. Yeah, but the, the the thing is that like Syria doesn't have, with the exception of, of probably Russia, right? Syria doesn't have a clear partner. They don't have a clear partner, and they they have a lot of rebuilding. And a lot of normal, like like normalization. To, they have partners. They have Iran, and they have. I'm not well, saying so that's that what that's what I'm gonna, saying. It, you know, like my point Iran is would not be to make one that... of their partners, and I'm not saying that Iran would try and control them or manipulate them or try to turn them into a Shia government. Like that's that's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is that I do think that they're. I don't think that their their relationship is going to chill. I, I think it'll I think it'll remain and Iran would would take the seize that opportunity as saying like hey look we're under a million sanctions right now right we need a way to make money we have oil you need oil let's make a deal I'm not saying that's gonna happen I'm just saying it's an interesting I think it's something interesting to look out for like I don't think it's set in stone that Iran's gonna have all this influence in Syria after the war that's like that's the point I'm trying to make mm-hmm. like it's not I'm just trying to draw a, a clear difference between the extreme of what happened between Iran and Iraq after after Saddam Hussein was removed from power right. nothing like that's gonna happen in Syria that's the main point I'm trying to make right. obviously they're still going to be partners and working together they really have no choice like at this point because they're they're going to be ostracized by Regardless. a large chunk of yeah. by a large chunk of the western world mm-hmm. but now that other arab states are opening their doors you know they're kind of going to assad and be like oh we almost got gotcha. you like you know they're they're kind of going to assad right now it's like you know this was just this was not personal you know this was only business <laughs> yeah. that's kind of like what's going on mm-hmm. it's it's business never personal mm-hmm. um i just find it hard to believe that they would that assad would align back with those gulf states after after that he's you know? probably not gonna i mean i don't know what choices he's gonna have yeah. um they're all gonna be hard to, to be very all, clear they're all gonna be hard because this country is coming off a nine-year devastating at- atrocious war he's gonna have a lot of tough choices yeah. he's gonna well, have one to thing's make. for certain he's definitely having an election that's i think that's absolutely certain because like he needs to legitimize his claim you know uh, and eventually, I think that Syria, excuse me, I think that, yeah, I think that Syria and Turkey are going to, their relationship is going to cool off for all the reasons I mentioned above, because right. Turkey is going to, you know, they're going to see them as the partner that they need for their ambitions with, with the PKK. And um, what I actually think is that all these guys from Idlib are going to slowly filter out over the next couple of months. And there, I mean, I could be totally wrong about this prediction, but this is just me pontificating and, and really speculating uh, without any empirical evidence to back this up, except for the fact that Syrian, some of these these uh, foot soldiers, these Turkish proxies are moving from Syria to Libya right now. And it seems like that Libya is is, is shaping up to be the new really big battlefield and in, in I mean, in North Africa, I know in the MENA region, you know, the North Africa, Middle Eastern region, I think that's shaping up to be the new really big battlefield. It's been a big battlefield for a really long time. Nobody talks about, but there are no signs of the civil war in Libya slowing down anytime soon. It looks like things are getting worse. And I think a lot of these crazies are going to filter out because they're going to need jobs. You know, it's not like... (laughs) It's not like you just. Oh man! There's these stories about a lot of these guys going back to Europe and being let back in the country, but the majority, a lot of them, are not being let back. They're not being uh, accepted by their former governments. And um, if you are like, "Oh yeah, what were you doing in Syria?" Oh, I was fighting to create a, a caliphate. <laughs> I was in the army of conquest, <laughs> trying to trying Here's to my uh, resume. remove, uh, trying to remove uh, a. Uh, a uh, Ba'athist dictator from power, uh, but also create a Islamic state with Sharia law. Uh, they're not going to be accepted. So I think they're going to be filtered. I mean, they're going to be lifelong mercenaries, most of these guys who don't die, who don't go to the gallows. Um, so I think a lot of these guys are going to filter out into Libya. It's funny because the guy who I frequently listen to, um, I, I always mention this guy because he is a... You know, he's a sympathizer with a lot of the rebels in Syria, and that's why I find him so interesting because I, I always like hearing a, his point of view on things. Um, Bilal, 
Abdul Kareem, who uh, does OGN Network on the ground news. He interviews these, you know, these uh, these rebel leaders. I heard him say in a Q and A, someone asked him, it's like, oh, what are you gonna do? Are you gonna open it?" It's like, yeah, I think we may go to Libya uh, to cover the news there. <laughs> so it made me think that, like, hmm, that's an interesting. Like, I haven't really thought about that, but I think a lot of these guys with with the, the transportation of of uh, rebels from Syria to Libya, I think that might be a trend, um, especially with with Turkish energy ambitions in the Mediterranean there. And their support for the government in Libya and preserving it and not allowing, um, you know, the the secular government to to uh, rise and take power. I think that I think that could be a thing. But what I think what's really showing is that these guys who are fighting are not freedom fighters. They're just proxy fighters. They're proxy fighters for Turkish ambitions in the region rather than people who are fighting for you know, some type of greater cause. Maybe some of them are. Maybe some of them think they're, you know, they're dying for Allah. But uh, a lot of them are just, you know, I think the big question with all these things is who's being used by who? Right. Like, is the government using the proxies or is the proxy using the government? Right. It takes two to tango. Mm-hmm. But it's, um, and I think there's truth to both sides. You can see it in both, in both directions, you know, is, did the, uh, the U.S. used the Mujahideen, or did the Mujahideen use the United States? Did the Contras use the U.S., or did the United States use the Contras? Did you know? You can say that with every single proxy, but you know, with with every single proxy force, did um, did Al Qaeda use their state backers, or did you know their state backers use Al Qaeda? Did the Houthis use Iran, or did Iran use the Houthis? Yeah, and I, it seems more and more likely that th- there seems like there's a lot more evidence now that Iran's back in the Houthis than there was, at least when we first started doing this podcast. Mm-hmm. But what I think is that they're doing a lot more. They're backing them. I don't know if they're backing them as much right now, but a couple of months, like five months ago, there was a lot of there's a lot of evidence showing that Iran was was, uh, was messing around. Yeah, was was messing around in there. But um we haven't covered that topic in a while. We probably should get back to it pretty soon. Well, I mean, um, this, this is, uh, this is great. I mean, well, I mean, it's not great, but thanks for, you know, following up on this. Cause I, you know, we spent a lot of time on this last episode, uh, and it keeps moving. And I was super curious to see, you know, it, particularly whether Siri was able to gain control of those highway systems, um, and I found I think it's pretty interesting that they got as the we record M5. this, they have the M5 but not the M4 yet, right. but they're gonna have the M4 soon. Yeah, it's it's like a ticking clock. It's who knows when if it's gonna be another series of negotiations or or um, I mean, who knows what's really gonna happen? Predicting these things is uh almost impossible, yeah, but. Right now, Russia's saying, hey, we're, we're back in our Syrian partners. They're going to take the rest of their country. There's nothing that you can do about it. So quit crying and leave. Like, that's what they're saying. Like, you can cooperate with with us, and you can, you can remove these guys. You can remove these rebels from these areas and cooperate with us, or you will get, cross, you'll get caught in the crossfire. And that's what they're saying to Turkey right now. And Turkey is left with... with a big decision because I think in the long run, if they if they pursue a antagonistic policy with both Russia and Syria, it will be pretty bad for them. Yeah. It would be really bad for their economy in the long run. And um, I don't know what Erdogan's doing. I think he's he's playing a political game and he's fallen too deep. He, he's kind of like a Turkish neocon. <laughs> yeah, kind of. I'm I'm All super right. curious to see if like if other NATO countries are like are like trying to be like yo cut the shit or one like you're gonna cause you know conflict with russia and we don't want that um yeah i I think some nato countries are on the side of turkey like england is but i think some countries are probably are more critical like france is right now so i think there's a split i mean not nato is not one conglomerate organization where everyone agrees on everything of course not yeah it's they're they're they a bunch different of different interests, countries right, with different yeah. interests. It's just an alliance system where you attack that country, we all have to attack the other. It's 
Russia's not attacking Turkey anytime soon. Like this is never there's never going to be a threat of like Russia bombing you know t- Turkish units over the Turkish border. Like yeah. that's not going to happen. Yeah, but if they get caught in the crossfire while Turkey does some stupid shit, you know. Hmm. They've already got caught in the crossfire. I know, and they've held some restraint thus far, but like for how long? But that's not part of, like, they're fighting a foreign war right now. Mm-hmm. They're outside of their borders. They're in Syria, which is a sovereign country. Yep. So that doesn't really apply. Hey, man, I if hear they you. attacked, if Syria was started, if they started launching artillery into the Turkish border, then the rules apply. Then you have to come and defend your NATO ally. But right, right now, Turkey's out fighting a foreign war. They're, mm-hmm. they're across their borders right now. They're in a sovereign nation with an elected president. Yep. So uh, they're, they're, Obviously, countries are going to give them lip service of support like the United States, but um, they're not going to do anything. Trump wants to get out of that area. He clearly does. Well, he, there get is out certain of Syria and go that, somewhere else, right? <laughs> I don't necessarily – I don't think Trump wants to go somewhere else. I think he just wants to we'll – I don't see. think – I still – since like you know, I, I – uh, I almost said uh, I support Trump. Yeah. Meant, I meant <laughs> to say that I, um, <laughs> I criticize I criticize Trump when, whenever I think it's warranted, um, and I think he has a lot of lousy people in his cabinet. I still don't think he wants to get bogged down in a war, especially right now. I think he's trying. I think he. I think he's just kind of like an old Fox News boomer, who doesn't want to get into a war but he still believes in this thing like surgical strikes work like all we need to do is use american military might for a quick surgical strike and then we'll get in and get out no american troops dead and we'll just decimate them bomb I think the hell that's out kind of his mentality that's yeah bomb the hell out of them carpet bomb them um i think that's his mentality because he knows how politically unpopular uh, caskets coming back to the USR. Sure. So sure. I, th- so Look, I'll give you that. He probably doesn't want to go to war, but he, no, but he doesn't want to pick... actions would drag him into one. <laughs> it, yeah. His actions would drag him into one. If he continues the antagonistic relationship with Iran, mm-hmm. who knows what will happen. But in Syria, I, I, he's just looking at that. Like, why are we here? I, I think Trump does put a line in, in the sand when it comes to backing like Al Qaeda groups, because um, he put a stop to that. You know, we, he put a stop to the CIA backing a lot of these extreme groups that the U.S. were backing when Obama was president. But he, uh, uh, I, I, he obviously doesn't have a full grasp of what's going on, and not really giving, not trying to give Trump like too much moral credit or anything like that. I just don't think that he wants to be there. I think he wants. He he sees no utility in being in Syria. Well, it whatsoever. certainly won't help him get elected, for sure. So. No, it will not. All right, you want to wrap this thing up? Yep. All right. Um, thank you guys for for joining us for another episode. Um, Scott Horton will be on the show. We're interviewing him on Friday, so we'll probably release the episode, the interview early over the weekend on our Patreon. So another reason to join us on Patreon. But uh, yeah, we're gonna be talking to Scott. Um, I reached out to some of you guys um, who uh, who contact me frequently. If there were any questions that you wanted me to ask them, um, feel free to reach out to me. If there's anything that you want, if you anything you thought I should ask them, but uh, yeah, we'll be talking to Scott on Friday, so it should be a really uh, intense interview as always. And then uh, yeah, it's uh, going to content looks pretty good going forward. Isn't that right, Danny? That's so right. But until now, rate and review the podcast. Give it a five star review. It always helps us. Um, we're approaching two fifty, I think, and yep. it'd be nice to get over that mark so we can uh, get three hundred of those. And uh, yeah, help us grow. Share. Tell your friends. Um, you know, as Scott Horton always says, tell, tell your cousin Jimmy. <laughs> <laughs> tell your friends. Tell your cousin Jimmy and your cousin Bobby. <laughs> like, um, but yeah, uh, appreciate it and. Uh, Peace.